Does God still heal? What's your opinion? What do you think? Does God still heal? Uh, maybe, maybe you weren't paying attention. Let me ask you, do you believe that God still heals today? Okay, okay, okay. I agree with you, by the way. I think that God is still in the business of healing. Before we get into our message, let me, let me ask God's blessing on our time. God, we lift this moment to you. Lord, we're dealing with a topic that is very important, and that is seeing the supernatural display of your hand today. God, I believe that you are still the same God of yesterday, today, and forever. Your ministry has not changed. And so, Lord, this morning, I know there are people here that need a touch from you. And so, God, I pray you would show up. And that, Lord, you would meet the needs and you would display your power. And, God, we will give you the credit. We will give you the glory. And so we lift this to you now in Jesus' name. And all agreed said, amen. I want to share a story with you that happened years ago at Harvest Christian Fellowship where I was a pastor. I think I've mentioned this before, but it really applies to today. Her name was Wanda, and I called her Wonderful Wanda. Wanda was one of those churchgoers that just, you know, put a smile on your face. You know, she's just bright sunshine. Wanda, everybody loved her. A little bit of history behind Wanda. Wanda was a registered nurse um, in almost her entire life for like 30 years. Uh, and she spent the majority of her life in the medical field. Uh, Wanda, just being such a beloved sister in the church and so always prayerful and always encouraging. Well, one day Wanda came up to me and she said, Pastor Jason, I've been diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. Uh, the doctors say that it is, it's, it's everywhere. And my chances of survival are very minimal. But Jason, our God does the impossible. I'm like, that's right, Wanda. Our God does the impossible. So Pastor Jason, this is what I need you to do. This coming week, I need you to come to my house. I'm going to call a family meeting at my house. My, my son, Jeremy, is not a believer. My, my daughter, Andrea, she's not walking with God. I'm calling a family reunion at my house. And I need you to bring the oil. And I need you to bring like a serious prayer. You are not allowed to pray or any wimpy prayers at my house, okay? You can't pray like maybe if God will or put like a backdoor prayer if it's not God's will for me to. She's like, you can't pray any of that. You need to come to my house and you need to pray that God will heal me in front of my family because God's going to heal me and he's going to save my family as a result. I'm like, oh my goodness, are you serious right now? You're like, this lady's crazy, you know, like... Oh, okay, Wanda, no problem at all. And so I had like, you know, gone and I told some of my pastor friends about it. And, and I was a little pushed back. It's the first time in my pastoral ministry that somebody had that type of confidence in God's ability to do the miraculous. So nonetheless, the day came. I drive to her house in Orange County. Her daughter's also an RN, a registered nurse. And so I'm there. And as I walk in, all the family is there. Okay, And we're in the living room. And so there's Wanda, you know, and she's smiling. And she has the scans to prove the breast cancer. Okay, this is not made up. This is not like something that, you know, oh, I've heard it one time and it's fictitious. And no, this is like a real situation, friends, okay? So here's the scans. She sits down and the family's there. And she's like, all right. Well, I called all of you, my family, to let you know uh, that I've got breast cancer. And, and they're like, what? So she didn't really told them yet. And the doctor says, it's not good. Here's all the evidence. Here's this. But good news, Pastor Jason is here today. <laughs> I'm like, okay, <laughs> what? And he's going to pray over me and God's going to heal me. And Jeremy, you're going to come to faith. Andrea, you're going to come back to the Lord. Grandkids, you're going to see God's work at hand. And just the confidence and so I said, okay, you know, and so I pulled out my little vial, you know, I'm like, all right, you know, well, and, and I'm feeling a little intimidated, to be honest with you, but I've got my little vial of oil. And so I walk over and I just open my Bible and I say, well, James chapter five, verse 14 says, if anybody's sick, let them call for the elders of the church and let him pray and anoint them. You'll see it on the screen, anoint with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. I read the verse. It's nothing special. There's not like a crazy healing thing that's going on. There's not things falling from the sky. There's not voices. It's just a normal, kind of normal, you know, event. I pull on my oil. I say, well, family, it's time we pray. So I walk over. I pull on my oil. I rub some on her head, 
And I pray. And I pray, God, would you heal her? You can do it. I don't pray any special prayer, but I definitely don't give any buts or ifs. I, I was obedient to what Wanda wanted me to do. I didn't pray like, God, maybe you can. I said, God, you can. I know you will. You are the God of the impossible. There's nothing too hard for you. you can, if you can split seas, if you can stop the sun in the sky, if you can tear down walls, if, you, if you've done it in the past, you can do it today. And so, God, I pray in Jesus' name that you would heal her. Jesus' name, amen. Just then, you know, so she like, bows she's like, Jesus' name, Amen. I'm healed. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, Jeremy, get in the car. We're going to the doctor. And I'm like, okay. So she, guess what? She goes to the doctor. Guess what? She goes in, she takes the scans and the mouths of the doctors drop. Why? Because it's gone. Literally the cancer's gone. Like gone. Like it was, it was there. Here's the scans. Here's the scans. It literally blew my mind to see this event that took place. This isn't a hearsay. This is like a real situation. Wonderful Wanda. And then guess what ends up happening? Her son, Jeremy, he comes to faith. Andrea comes back to the Lord. Jeremy's still like one of the security guys at Harvest Christian Fellowship today in Orange County. Like the family's walking with God. This was an event that, that a lady came and asked for prayer, believing that God could do the impossible. And God showed up and did the impossible. I'm telling you, God can still heal today. Do you agree? Come on. This is amazing. God is able to heal anyone, anywhere, anytime of anything. And I believe it. Jeremiah 32, 27 says, Behold, I'm the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Just as physical healing played a significant role in Jesus' earthly ministry, I still think it's important for him today to display his power in doing the miraculous. Here's a question, though. Does God heal every single time that we ask him? I would say he does. You're going to be like, what? Are you serious, pastor? You're telling me that God heals every single time? I want to promise you that God is never unresponsive to your prayers. God is never unresponsive to the prayers made on your behalf. God hears every prayer, every cry, every plea, every whimper, and even hears your tears. Psalm 56.8 says, You have counted my tossings and put my tears in your bottle. Psalm 103 verse 8 tells us what type of God he is. I know some of you are very anxious at the moment. Like, I can't believe he said that he heals every time. Just give me one moment. God reminds us of who he is. He is a merciful and gracious God, Psalm 103, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. But here's the catch. We know and believe that God is God and we are not. Do we, we believe that, right? You're not God. You know that, right? You're not God. He is God. We are not. He is all-knowing. You are not. He is all-present. You are not. He is all-powerful. You are not. God sovereignly reserves the right to decide what the greatest healing in your life is. So here's where it gets down. Oftentimes we ask God for a certain healing and we beg God to move on our behalf. Sometimes he answers in the way we think, but he always answers in the way that he knows best. Always, which is a healing. My sons, they're very special to me. I've got three of them, okay? Twelve, five and seven months, okay? The seven-month-old doesn't make too many demands of me. It's more of mom. But nonetheless, I love my boys, all right? So I love my children. I talk to my children. I listen to my kids. I, I provide for them. I protect them. And when they come and ask me for things, maybe it's help or assistance, oftentimes I tell them yes. I say, Jesus. Oftentimes I tell my boys, yes, like, hey, no problem, boys, let's do that. Let's go for that. Yeah, I can help you, no problem. But there's also times that I tell them, no. More often than not, though, I choose a greater option that they are unaware of. My sons come and ask me for something like, hey, dad, can I have this, this piece of candy? And I'm like, no, I've got a chocolate bar over here. You know, like I, I'm blessing them in greater ways than they could ever imagine. And they have no choice as the children. They just got to trust dad because he knows best. Dad knows best. In your life, I want to submit to you that whatever you have going on in your life, God is aware. God knows. 
God knows your greatest need. God knows the greatest way to provide. God knows the greatest deliverance that you need. And so even at times when you make your prayers, he's always got something in mind and it might align with your request or it might be greater than your request. God is always at work in you. The Bible says in Matthew 7, 11, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who's in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Like, I just want you to let your heart rest in the fact that God is a good God on your behalf. If you know God, he is a good heavenly father. God is not an evil God. He's not an unjust God. He's not a silent God. Now, there's probably right now things popping in your mind where you would feel like, but God didn't answer when I asked. God didn't heal when I begged. I know families in here that have walked very difficult roads and they prayed by faith and they asked and we anointed, but God did not show up in the way that we wanted him to show up. So we have to do something with our theology. It's either that God is not a good God or we don't understand his goodness. It's one of the other two. And I'm going to submit that it's you don't understand his goodness. That he's actually got something better in store as the cosmic manufacturer of everything. That he has your best in store even if you're unable to comprehend it in the moment. You know, there'll be times that God doesn't answer in the way that you hoped, but he always answers in the way that shows you what real hope is. I'm thinking of an example of that guy that was brought to Jesus on that bed. Remember the paralyzed man in Mark chapter 2? If you don't remember the story, Jesus was doing his normal earthly ministry. He was inside of a house, and some friends heard that Jesus was in town. They had a friend that was paralyzed, and so they went to the paralyzed man's house and like, hey, bro, listen, Jesus is in town, and we're going to take you to him. And so they get a little like caught together, and four of them are like, you know, carrying, and they run across the town with this paralyzed guy on like, like a bed sheet, and they can't get in the house. The Bible says like it's too packed, so they can't get in. And so they're like, you know what, let's go up on the roof. And so they go on the roof, and then they tear up the roof, like destroying people's property, right? And they, that's how desperate they are. And they lower him down on a sheet in front of Jesus in this house. Like, this is pretty amazing. This is an epic story. A paralyzed guy sitting in front of God in flesh. But what does Jesus do? It says in Mark chapter 2, listen to what Jesus did. It says, Then the paralytic was brought to him, carried by four men. Since they were unable to get to Jesus through the crowd, they uncovered the roof above him, made an opening, and lowered the paralytic on his mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. That's interesting. They wanted him healed, and Jesus forgave his sins. Why is it that Jesus did not do what they requested? It was obvious. It's not like it was like a, a guessing game, what they were there for. The guy can't walk. It was clear that there was an obvious need, but Jesus did something instead. Jesus went after his greatest need first. His guilty heart was worse than his paralyzed legs. So Jesus went after the, the most severe thing first. I'm going to forgive you of your sins. I'm going to ease that burden on your, your conscience. I'm going to wipe away your sins. I'm going to give you the promise of heaven when you die. Then after that, Jesus did and did heal the man, but he did it to prove that he could initially forgive. Just like an emergency room doctor, if you were to go to the emergency room and you walk in and you're like, doctor, I've got a headache, but you've also got a knife wound in your back and you're bleeding out. The doctor's, you know, not going to care about your headache, all right? Like, he's not going to be like, but doctor, I've got this splitting migraine. He's like, no, you've got a knife in your back, bro. You know, like, let me handle the knife. It's more important. Your headache, okay, we'll deal with that a little bit later. Let's handle the knife wound. Jesus knows how to intervene in your life to handle the greatest need. The greatest need, the most tragic, the most despairing need that you have, and you might not even be aware of it. When we come to God on the topic of prayer and healing and intervention this morning, we have to recognize that we're not going to understand everything that God does and the work he's doing in us, but we can be confident he is at work in us. All right? So now I want to show you the text. I want to show you the text that I showed Wanda that day and what the Bible tells us about 
real people who have real situations, who have real needs, and what they're supposed to do according to the Bible in order to ask for God's intervention. All right, so if that's you, or if you know of somebody, pay close attention. We're in James chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. Let's look at it again, and we're going to go through it today. And then at the end of service, if that is you, we're actually going to pray for you today. So we're going to pray at the end of service, if, that's, if you meet this category, that God would heal you today. But let's first look at what it says. James chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. It says, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over them, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who's sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. All right, pause in there. It opens up with, is anyone among you sick? Now, I'm going to teach you a little bit of Greek this morning because it's important. Unfortunately, the English translations have really just painted with a broad brush a lot of the meanings here. This word sick is a very common word sick in the Greek, and it literally means anything and everything that might ail you, all right? So this is like all-inclusive. This is not like specific. It's uh, any illness or disease or diagnosis from a headache to cancer, from back pain to organ failure, whether you're born with it or you caused it. Whether it's a result of an accident or you inflicted it by your own hand. It could be gradual throughout the years, like arthritis, or all of a sudden. It could even be the result of a decision you made or a sin that you committed. I know some people that are battling some sicknesses because of some sins that they, uh, they committed in their life. This type of sickness encompasses anything that's not right in your body. A mental struggle or battle, an emotional imbalance or extreme or even spiritual attacks. Yes, even spiritual attacks can make you sick. If you've ever struggled with stress, if you've ever been bogged down by worry, let me tell you, there's an enemy behind that. And stress is a leading cause to a lot of ailments in the U.S. When someone is sick or weary or exhausted, what are they supposed to do? It's very clear. This is a prescription. So now God is telling you, this is what you're supposed to do. Let him call for the elders of the church. We have very clear instructions. Who is the one that's supposed to call out for help? The sick person. Okay, this is obvious. This is clear. Uh, this is what happens in the heart. Okay, I just want to say, it, James is very clearly placing the responsibility of the initiation of the prayer on the sick person and not the church leadership. So my biggest issue I have with a lot of the faith healers is that they're not following the instruction. It says very clearly that it's the sick person. It's Wanda coming after me. It's you. Listen what they're doing. You're recognizing your need of intervention. So you're in your place in your life doing your thing and you've got something that's bigger than you. You're like, God, I need you. I can't handle this anymore. Tylenol don't work and the doctor is silent. I need help, God. You recognize that you need help. You trust the will and the desire of God over your life. You make a decision to call out for help. You humble yourself to go to a place and ask for the leadership of the church, confessing to them what's going on very specific in your life. And if it's something that's been caused by sin in your life, then, then guess what? There's a little bit of humility. There's a little bit of openness there's a sense in which you lay bare what's going on in your life because you need God's intervention. Do you see what's happening in the sick person's life? This isn't like a vague prayer. Oh, can you pray for me? Like, you know, in general, you know, like, no, 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 no. Like, you better tell me exactly what's going on and how you got it and what's happening for how long. Tell me how it's hurting you. You know, like, this is what it's saying is you're being very specific. Then you're in submission to the instruction of God. You're even surrendering to the will of God. Let him call on the elders of the church. How often does this really happen? I can tell you in my 18 years of ministry, I've had about seven people do this. Seven. I was, I was thinking this morning, as much as I had, only seven. And I was at a church of like thousands upon thousands where they specifically got, this is what I need. Would you anoint me? Would you heal me? I believe God can do it. As James lays out, there's been seven I'm aware of. 
he goes on making it clear. This is what you're supposed to do. Now, I, I think back, like, why? Why are we slow to do this? Maybe it's because we're quicker to call the doctor than you are God. Maybe you're quicker to the medicine drawer than the maker. <laughs> that was my wife, so it counts. Thank you, love. Maybe we like Google more than God. The reality, there will be times that God will send a situation your way that's beyond Google, that's beyond doctors, it's beyond what you can figure out in your sphere of friends and your Facebook looking and your web MD searching, and you'll be left with no other option but to go to God if you're humble enough to ask for it and do it His way. Who are the sick to call for? So they're to call out, the sick make the decision to go, but who are they looking for? It says here, let him call for the elders of the church. So they're to look for not their friends, they're not looking out for somebody else, but they're going to a single location. They're going to the church. In our day and age of people that don't like the church, that are like, I'm sick of church, I'm over the church, I'm over organized religion. Would you rather it be unorganized religion? You know, like, I'm just tired of the whole thing. You know, like, I'm like, God has decided that there is a, a, a heaven-made earth-dwelling entity that God has established called the church, and it's for your benefit. Like, this is for your good. Sick people go to church. It's very clear. But why do we neglect church? Why do we not go after it? What is church? Church is a gathering of people who have been called out of the dark, and we're in God's glorious light. That's what it is. The Greek word ekklesia literally means be called out. So you've got it globally and locally. Globally, there are people that we are blood related with, the blood of Christ, brothers and sisters in the family of God that are around the globe. But it's also local where we've got this church here. Welcome to Jesus City. I'm glad you're here. And there's other churches in the city that we have more in common with those brothers and sisters in Christ than your own blood you know, siblings that you have where we are going to spend eternity in heaven, the church. It is the, the dwelling of the people of God in a local setting together. And what we're doing together is that we have mutual edification. So we're here not only for God. So we came Sunday morning because we're going to worship God together, right? That's why we're here. We're here to worship God. We're here to say, God, we love you. We're putting you first. So we're here to worship God. We're here to hear God's word. We're here to encourage each other. Where if I see a need in your life, I'm going to try to meet it. I'm going to try to, to supply. I'm going to do all that I can. Church is meant for encouragement, worship, correction, intervention, and accountability. Church. The sick person is going to church. And they're going to open up at church. Which sounds a little scary, right? Because how many churches have backstabbed you? How many churches have talked behind your back because you did open up? Right? And everybody knew? But nonetheless, that's Jesus' bride. And if you don't like the church, you're talking about Jesus' bride. You want to get ups me upset at you? Talk about my wife. I'll be upset with you real quick. The church is Jesus' bride. He loves her. She's not perfect. But it's something he's established for your good. Too often we live in communities of isolation, not even knowing our, our next-door neighbor but here God says, you know what? No, I'm going to create an entity where you can come and you can open up and you can say, here are my wounds. Here's my sickness. Here's what's going on. This is the place that you go. The church should be a beacon in the dark. That's what it's meant to be. Jesus City should be a light on Dexter Avenue. So when they, when they drive by, they're like, I'm sick. I can go there. I can go there. That's the way it's supposed to be. Okay, so the sick person has in mind when they don't know where else to go, I can go to church. I can go to church. Is that how you feel about church? When your marriage falls apart, things don't make sense, and life, it's like crushing down on you, and everything's falling out from the bottom, where do you go? This says you better go to church. That's what it says. You get your butt in church, because they can help you, because they love you, because that's God's design. That's the way it's meant to be. Church was not what they did. It was who they were. I am church. You are church. We bring church with us. This is just a building. We make it church when we showed up and worship God together. And when we got sick among us, hey, you're in the right spot. Now that they're in church, who do they ask for? It's very specific. It says, 
you who are sick, call for the elders of the church and let them pray over you. Here we're given another Greek word, presbuteros, where obviously the Presbyterians have taken that to name the denomination. But it means a, a plurality, a group of, of leaders in a local congregation. So we have got pastors, shepherds, leaders, the, the really the, the overseers of a flock. That's who the sick person is going to. They're going up to them. This means that they recognize the authority that they have placed by God over them. Church is a reminder that you know, when we come, we're saying, God, I recognize that you're in control and I am not. And when you submit yourself under church leadership, you're also recognizing God's order and how he does things. You want to know why your life is out of order? Maybe you haven't allowed a pastor to speak into your life yet. Maybe you've not allowed someone with spiritual eyes to say, hey, you, 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 you know, you're, you're working a lot more and you're spending time with your, your wife. You know, maybe you should turn down the promotion and you just, you know, go home on Friday night, you know? Like, if you invite pastors into your life, spiritual leaders, they can see the spiritual deadness and give you wisdom, just like a good doctor or like a good dentist over here. And, you know, they, they've got the eyes to see. Okay, so a pastor. It's interesting to me how many people are scared of a pastor in their life. I was on a plane not too long ago and uh, sat next to a guy and opened up my book, you know, my Bible. And, uh, but I actually didn't have it open yet. I just had it closed, you know. And so he, um, he's like, so what do you do? You know, and I didn't answer the question. I'm like, what do you do? And he's like, oh, I'm this. And, I, and he's like all jovial and happy and like, rah, 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 you know, just talking away. And, and then finally, you know, like I, I, have, I have my Bible on me, you know, and then I kind of open it up. I'm dropping everything. I open it up and he's like, what's that? Oh, this? It's just a Bible. Why do you have a Bible? Because I'm a pastor. Oh, you're a pastor. Air buds go in, and he didn't talk to me the rest of the flight. I wonder why it is. Why is it that we will allow other people to speak into our life, but you won't let a pastor speak into your life? Some people are afraid to go to the doctors and you will live with pain. Some people are afraid to go to the dentist and you will live with pain. If you're afraid of a pastor, you will live in pain. It's important that you're honest with your pastor. And I'm not just saying it because it's me. I'm saying in general, whatever church you ever go to, if you're military and you get PCS somewhere else, be honest with your pastor. Go to a pastor, go to the church, submit under the leadership, and be honest with them. Confess to them. Verse 15 at the end of it, it says, if they've committed a sin, they'll be forgiven. So they're being completely honest. Like, yeah, I was doing some stuff I wasn't supposed to do, and now I've got this disease. Or I was fooling around. You, you name it. You're being honest and open. Here's my situation. Would you pray for me? Confession of sin, confession of situation, that's what you're supposed to do. Okay. So that's the sick person's job. Now let's transition. What does the pastor do? I want to show you a lot of the weight, where the weight of this is put, and it's on the pastoral leadership. Look at verse 14. So the sick person goes to church. They ask for the pastors to be prayed for. And here's what pastors are supposed to do. And let them pray over them, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. This is pretty amazing. The pastor's job is to be available to the sheep, to be there and present. And his job is to pray and anoint. These are the two ingredients. There's nothing special. There's nothing that you need to like raise your voice about. Okay, this is very basic and, and like, you know, ground level. What are you supposed to do? Pray, pray a prayer of faith and anoint in the name of the Lord, and then God will do his part. So the pastoral work is that we are shepherds, where we are just here and available, and we say, look, we love you. Well, another issue with mega, mega, mega churches is the pastors aren't available. You've got sick people that want prayer, and they're not there. But shepherds know their sheep. A good shepherd smells like the sheep. A good pastor is known among the flock. The pastor's job is to be available, which is hard. There's a lot of sacrifice that goes into being a pastor. There's a, there's a lot of work. You know, uh, I was with somebody not too long ago. They're like, you know, all you guys do is preach on Sunday. I'm like, man, it's a lot more preaching on Sunday, bro. Like, that's the easiest part. How about you pray over somebody that's dying of cancer? Because you can clock in and clock out when you're a plumber, right? 
Like if you've got like a bad, bad plumbing job, you can sleep that night. But let me tell you, you don't clock out as a pastor. You, you go home and you pray and you beg God and you have sleepless nights and it affects your wife and your children. And, and it's a spiritual attack that goes over you. How, how about you go in a, in, in a hotel room uh, where, where there's a husband and a wife, they're getting ready to break up. Or you go in a hospital, like not too long ago, Christina Widmere, a mom, young mom that died of brain cancer. And I was there holding her hand with her last breath with her two young children and her husband at the bedside. That's hard. It's hard. Like pastoral ministry just means that you're available for the working of God, but you're there to serve the people of God. And what we see here is that their job is to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. It's that easy. It's that simple. But look what they're supposed to do. I'm going to get into it and then we're, we'll be done. They're to one, they're to pray over, which literally means lay hands upon, where the pastor puts his hand on you. Okay? Touching. Your arm, your head, saying, look, I'm with you. That's all that simply means, I'm with you. Then they're to anoint. Why anointing? Have you ever wondered why? Like, why, why do the church anoint people? Why is it the cross? You know, like, why do they do that? Very simple. Oil in the Bible is very significant. Some of the first times we see oil mentioned uh, with Abraham, even with, with Jacob anointing a stone, we see anointing all over the Bible, but one specific would be in the book of Leviticus, where in Leviticus, you've got these priests that were dedicated to the work of God, and they took oil and they, they anointed their garments, they anointed the priests, and it just meant that they were set apart. They were, they were dedicated to the service of God. And so when I anoint you, what I'm saying is you are dedicated to God. You're recognizing that this sign on my body is between me and God. And I'm telling God, this anointing is telling me, God, I'm separated to you. I'm dedicated to you, God. So if there's any riffraff going on in your life, you need to change it, right? Because you're saying, look, I'm a, I'm a vessel wholly dedicated to God. But then in 1 Samuel, when David got anointed by, by, by Samuel, don't you remember like little David got anointed to be the king of Israel? And uh, maybe we should do it how Samuel did it. It said he took a horn of oil and he poured it on his head. Like maybe I need like a five-gallon bucket from Home Depot and just be like, ah, bah, you know, uh, like dunk me, pasta. Uh, but it said when he was anointed that he was indwelt with the Spirit of God there in 1 Samuel. So not only is it a, a, a symbol of dedication, but it's also a, a representation of the indwelling of the Spirit of God, where you are the temple of the Holy Spirit who's dwelling in you. And so you anoint by saying, this vessel's dedicated to you, God. Your Spirit is dwelling upon them. God, would you work on their behalf? And so we recognize it. That's all that it simply means. So we pray, we anoint. Just as Jesus and the disciples did in Mark chapter 6, it says, they cast out many demons and anointed with oil those who were sick and healed them. This is a biblical practice. When we anoint, we recognize that it's God that sees because it's in the name of the Lord that we do it. It's not in the name of Jesus City. It's not in the name of Jason Powell because I can't do nothing. It's not in any of the pastor's name or any other ministry's name. It's not in some handkerchief that they prayed for. It's not in some thing that you bought online. They anoint and pray in the name of the Lord because he gets the credit. God is the healer and nobody else. He does it. He does the impossible. You anoint in the name of the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, I anoint you. It's that type of power where there's no other name under heaven by which anyone will be saved. And one day every tongue will confess and every knee will bow to the name of Jesus Christ. And so we're just doing it a little bit early, that's all. We're just saying, hey, I recognize it's you, my Lord. It's you. What else does a pastor do? It says here that he prays. So he touches, he anoints, but now he prays. And the prayer of faith will save the sick. Here's a little Greek for you. Did you know that word pray is not the word pray? It's the word UK, which literally means vow, vow. What it says here is that the vow of faith or a confident, bold type of prayer will save the sick. So when you come to a pastor, remember how Wanda told me not to pray no wimpy prayer? She was right. She was right. Of anybody that you should be able to go to, it should be church leadership that they actually believe that God is the God of his word and he can do the impossible, right? 
That's what it's saying is that the pastor is able to say, no, 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 I've staked my life on this thing and I actually believe it and I'm going to pray for the impossible. So the pastor's job is to see what can't be seen, to pray the impossible, to ask for literally a miracle to take place. That's what he's doing. And so if you got any pastors like, oh, I don't know, you know, maybe it's like, man, go get prayer somewhere else, all right? Like, don't get prayer from that one, okay? Like, hey, if you don't got faith, man, look at it. And then, I need it. You remember, it was the faith of the friends that brought the paralytic. And oftentimes, I'm that friend for you. And where I'm the one that has the faith that God can do the miraculous. So he makes a vow, a, a prayer that is bold and confident, and it saves the sick. That word save is not the word heal. It doesn't say the word heal. It does not say that the prayer of faith will heal the sick. It says it'll save them. This is a general sense of pray and a general sense, I'm sorry, general sense of save. There's a different Greek word for heal and he uses it the next verse. So James knows what he's talking about. In verse 15 or 16, he says, uh, confess your sins one to another that you may be healed. And he uses the Greek word heal, but he doesn't use the Greek word heal here. Why? Because just maybe... When he says that when I've got a vow of confidence in God that I pray over you and anoint upon you, that maybe God's going to save you in a way that's greater than the healing that you're asking for. He's saying that he's able, he's opening up the spectrum. You come with one thing and God's like, oh, guess what? I'm going to do something different. I'm going to do something better. You might have not prayed for it, but I, this is how I'm going to move. God chooses how he's going to respond to the prayer, but here sozo in the Greek literally means restore, strengthen, or save. And so when I pray over you, I'm praying, God, would you get a hold of them? God, would you heal them? And God's like, I'm going to save them is what I'm going to do. I'm going to save them. If it means I save them by healing their body, then I'll do it that way. If it means I save them by touching their mind, if it means I, I save them by restoring their marriage, if it means I save them by taking them home to eternity, he will save you. He will save the sick and then he will raise you up. The Lord will raise him up. The picture here is this as we close. It's someone who's desperate, someone who's tired, someone who's exhausted and worn out, fatigued and worn thin. At the end of your rope, you're barely hanging on and you're broken on the inside. So you come to church and pastors are called, and we surround you, we anoint you, we touch, we pray, and then God shows up. God does the miraculous in your life. God will always respond to your prayers, always. He's not a silent God. He's not deaf to your prayers. Just because you can't see him moving does not mean he's not moving. He's at work in your life. So you can be confident every prayer you've ever prayed, every tear you've ever cried, God has paid close attention and he is at work in saving you, working in you what is absolutely greatest. God is able to do the impossible and I believe it. Do you? I do. I think he wants to do it today. We still ask for healing because he still heals. But we let the results fall back into his hand. Verse 15 says, and the Lord will raise him up. I've had no greater joy in my life than those moments that God has raised me up out of those pits that I was in that I could not get myself out of. Whether it's an addiction this morning, some type of struggle, there's a real healing that needs to take place. There's a real situation going on. Listen, I don't want to provoke you to come forward. I don't want to prod you to do it. It says very clear, you need to do it. You need to have enough submission under God and trust in him that you say, Pastor, I need it. I need prayer. Would you anoint me? Would you pray over me? Would you stand by faith with me? Would you declare these true things over my life? And God will raise you up. God will heal that heart. God will do the impossible. I think too often we just think that God will stop the storm. But often he delivers us even in it. So this morning, I'm going to close in prayer. And I've got some of the, the leaders of Jesus City that are going to come up in twos. And if you need it, then I want you to go up to them, confess, let them pray over you. 
and we're going to ask God for the impossible. Closing with Wanda, Wanda was healed that day. Amazing testimony. She told everybody. Tons of people got saved. Three years later, Wanda had a stroke. I went to the hospital and I brought my oil with me. I walk in the hospital room. She's in ICU. She's laying on her side. She's paralyzed on the left. And I walk in. I'm like, Wanda, what are you doing, girl? I'm like, I brought my oil. Hey, I'm here to pray. And she's like, Pastor, not this time. I said, what? What do you mean, Wanda? She said, I know he was going to heal me before. And he did everything I've ever asked him to do. I think he's going to take me home. But he also brought me to this hospital to reach the nurses and the doctors. And a nurse walked in, and her name was Jessica. And Wanda goes, like her, Jessica, she prayed to receive Christ. And then, you know, Jessica was like, she's like, that's right. Isn't this lady wonderful? And I'm like, that's what I call her, wonderful Wanda. Wanda, a vessel used by the Lord. God showed up in her life in a miraculous way. And then once again, she was plagued by something greater than herself. But she recognized the good hand over her life, that God was still good and kind. And she said, God, I'm okay with whatever you give me. She was submissive to the will of God. There are things we don't understand, but we submit ourselves to the will of God. And Wanda did pass away. I was able to do her funeral. And all of the doctors and all of the nurses and all of her family were there. And a bunch more people got saved because of the faith of Wanda. Amazing. Amazing. God will show up this morning. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he will. And we're going to ask for it. No ifs or ands or buts about it. We're going to trust him for the impossible. So as I close in prayer right now, this is going to be the closing out of the service, by the way. And so you're free to go. But if you do want prayer, we'll be up here, have a few different groups, and we'll pray for you and anoint you with oil. So let me pray. God, we thank you for this morning. God, we're so just quieted by the fact that you are God and we are not. Lord, you do the impossible. God, you're able to heal. You're able to intervene. You're able to deliver. You're able to restore. And Lord, this morning, we submit all of those things to you. God, this text is very clear that we're to come and we're to ask for it. You tell us that we have not because we ask not. So this morning, we ask by faith that you would heal, that you would show up, that you would do the impossible. You've done it before. We pray you would do it again. And so Lord, if there's anyone in here this morning that needs a touch from you, I pray God you that work in their heart. So we love you. We thank you for church this morning. We pray your blessing on our week. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All the greets said, amen. God bless you, family. Have a wonderful day.